When Seattle band Nirvana became the biggest rock phenomenon of the 1990s, the three members of the group were thrust into the world media spotlight almost overnight. And when lead singer Kurt Cobain committed suicide just a few years ago, there wasn't too much expectation placed on the shoulders of the other two. Certainly, nobody expected the drummer, Dave Grohl, to come fighting back with a brand new outfit and a hugely successful debut album which spawned hit singles around the world. But that's exactly what happened. And that band is Foo Fighters. Let's go and check them out now, just before they take the stage here at The Point in Dublin. Gee, look at look at the boat going by. Jesus, brilliant! Look, seriously, look. Look, look, quick! I swear to God. Wow. Yeah, you thought I was lying, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. It's very strange. Okay, that threw me completely. Oh yeah. All right. Listen, the album has been out a good while now. I mean, the debut album. So let's talk about album number two. Okay. I mean, first of all, is there something about album number one that you get something out of the way that it's worked very well for you as Foo Fighters, being a band of their own entity? They're all, you know, they're there. And now, second album. Well, I think with a lot of bands, when they release their first record, it's usually, um, it's usually uh, years and years of someone writing songs, and then they get together and record it. And then when it comes to their second album, they have maybe a year to come up with something that will top the first album. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like everybody, most bands spend three or four years in the practice space before they release an album and they spend a lot of time on their songs and so the first album is something that's taken a while to... so for the second record most band that's why it's the sophomore jinx because you have so little time compared to the first album most bands i don't know whatever i don't know what the hell i'm talking about <laughs> yeah but are you trying to tell me then that like secretly all down through the years say of the last band you were in you were writing loads of songs but because the lead singer was the one who put in the most of the songs, you said, no, no, I'm not writing anything. No, I'm not I, did, I, did, I did not want to contribute to that band for right. fear I'd pollute something. Sure. Well, like, were you worried about the fact that, like, I mean, you were seen as a drummer and you suddenly had to go out front? I mean, was it scary? Well, it still is. <laughs> it's horrifying. Have you ever done it? No. It's so... It's oh, no, I've never drummed terrible. either. <laughs> well, drumming's, drumming is all right because you can sort of hide yeah. behind these big tubs and <laughs> head down and just... But when you have nothing but this little microphone stand in front of you i'm almost skinny enough that i can hide behind it but there's that and there's you know and everybody looks at you like okay let's see some charisma i want some humor i want some banter in between songs and you, just, you know it's really scary and do you worry about that kind of thing still not really it's gotten to the point where i used to just sort of stand in front of the audience and think, oh my god, um, how should I move? What am I supposed to do? Should I say something funny? And now it's just gotten to the point where I turn around and look at everyone else and go, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little different. I'm, I'm the least charismatic of everyone in this band. Like, I'm just, people just look at me because I was in Nirvana and asked me all the questions. But God, if you were to ask the other guy, you, they're hilarious. But you're also at front in Foo Fighters. That's the point. That's true. But I uh, see, I don't really, I don't believe, in, in, the, in the case of like, David Bowie, David Bowie. You know, okay, he's out we're front. It's solo, David Bowie, that's, he's right there. But you that's know? a Christian name and a surname. But when you have, when you have a band of four people, I think they should be considered a unit. It shouldn't be the three guys with this one person out in front. I just, I don't believe in that really at all. I don't. Yeah, but that's the history of rock and roll. Not necessarily. I don't think so. Maybe from someone that's not a musician, but from someone that's been in bands. A lot, most, most of. A lot of the greatest bands couldn't function without one of the members. Oh, of course. You know? I mean, that's obviously true. But I mean, like, if I, like, I mean, if I think of talking to somebody in Talking Heads, I might talk of David Byrne. If I think of talking to somebody in Smashing Pumpkins, I might talk of Billy Corgan. Right. So that's that's pretty. Well, expected, that's true. Isn't but it? I've, yeah, but I mean, from from the media and from I suppose I suppose kids, they need one face to sort of connect. With that's it. This. Yeah. But I mean, for the people in the band, it's a unit. It's a band. Yeah. And so, I mean. It's ridiculous for one person in the band to step out and say, I am the spokesman of this band. Yeah. I'm going to... Well then, Dave, was that one of the reasons feels, why, you know? when the band started off, you were going to be in a band that was going to get more attention than your average band who were only around for a month? This is true. Right. And so. we realized that. Like, we knew that, you know, that, there, that people were going to want to talk to us and people were going, to, were going to give us this special attention because of the bands that we had been in or whatever. But that, I mean, that's, that was there why. was nothing we could do. That, I mean, there's not... And I mean, of course, I feel fortunate that that I'm able to sit and do an interview that people are going to watch. I mean, I'd be a fool to to think, you know, God damn it, I'm so, I, oh, this is such a drag yeah. that everybody comes to see our band play. That's, you know, I'd be a liar if I said that.
The impetus like to create some stuff was not stemming at all from Kurt's death, but it was actually stemming from the fact that Nirvana broke up. It was just to keep going, isn't that it? Well, it's just that I've been in bands since I was yeah. 14 years old, and it was what I loved doing, it's what I'd done all my life, and, and I love to write music, I love to perform, I love to, to go on tour for a certain amount of time. And, <laughs> um, so it was just basically just missing the life that I'd lived for 10 years, and then all of a sudden you're sitting at home with absolutely nothing to do until you just get off your ass and do something, you know? And did you look upon that sitting at home as a period of mourning kind of thing and then Foo Fighters is it now? Well, that of it? course, but yeah. Yeah, sure. That's what it was. Okay, well then, what about, was there any resentment from people at all, thinking like, like wait a minute, you know? I think so, but no one ever had the balls to come to my face and say, you know what, you're a real yeah. bastard for just getting up and starting another band. Like, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be this brooding, you, you, we never want to see your face again, except for those old live photos where they're all black and white and blurry and, yeah. you know. But I'd, surely if but, somebody had said it to your face, you would have just hit them back in the face. Well, no, I'd see, you know, what the f how, how do you, how does anyone know? I mean, how does anyone know the way I feel, you know? I mean, I don't sit around and speak in interviews about, about things that are, that are really <laughs> deep and personal. I mean, that's just nobody's business. I don't. I'm in a band, I play music, people jump around, and hey, that's fun. Rock and roll is like a circus, you know? Look at the, you go in there and there's 8,000 people and two big screen TVs, and it's like, hey, it's a, this is the big top, you know? This is the circus. Has not, to me, it's totally separate. From when I go home, I have a wife, I have a, a nice, comfortable living, and it's just, it's nice. I mean, I live a really normal life. I don't live this glamorous rock and roll thing, and I don't... I, I, I'd like to separate the two. So. Right. Okay, well, like, I mean, did you jump at the chance to join a band with Dave and the band? Or did you listen to his songs first? And no, realize, I listened to them. And did uh, you have any idea that the songs were going to be as good as they are? Because that's pathetic saying that in front of them, but anyway. It wasn't really, it didn't surprise me. But it was like, I mean, I was surprised, but I never, like, thought, oh, this guy's not capable of, you know, writing great music. It was just like, it was like, wow. It was really, uh, it was really cool. And I didn't really... I, my band, it was when Nate and I were on tour, on our last tour with our old band, we were listening to the tape, and then, and then when uh, we met in D.C. around Christmas time, we talked about it, just sort of like, sure, let's do it. Right. So when you did, like, get the band together, I mean, what sort of had you got in mind? Just to get out there, do a band, and see what happens. And are you then happy with the way it has happened over the past year? Yeah. Tour a little too much, too but much a little too much touring, but um, other than that, yeah, it's been really fun. Right. And there was never any thought that you were going to do, Dave, as kind of a solo project. No. It was always going to be a band. No. I mean, yes, was it? it was always going to yeah. be a band, but I couldn't. I'd just be the biggest buffoon if I was a solo artist. It would just be the most ridiculous thing you'd ever seen in your life. And were you worried about your voice, or, like just having to even sing throughout a concert all night long, yeah. which you never had to do before? Totally. What? I've only been doing it a year. That's what you I mean, know. Yeah. I mean, but like, I mean, is there something wrong with your voice? Is there? <laughs> no, I just I think so. Yeah, I, I hate my voice. <laughs> it's like it's voodoo. I've been jinxed with these sinuses. Damn them! Oh. Because like when Foo Fighters started, like you did very well from the word go. I mean, you had hit singles and stuff. I mean, things happened. This is a call, etc. Yeah. So like, I mean, that was what? Like, was it? Were we ever worried saying, well, this, this mightn't happen, you know? And suddenly it is quite huge. And we might just be a band just trundling along like a million other, say, Seattle bands or something. Didn't really well, worry about, we never really had a focus of, okay, is this going to, like, succeed? It was more just like we wanted to go out and play, you know? And, I, and the first tours we did, I mean, we didn't just, like, jump straight onto the bus yeah. and play the enormous venue. And No. I mean, we, the, our, for the first show we played was at a keg party in someone's bedroom. The second <laughs> show we played was in a crappy little place in... Portland, I mean, you know, we'd open up for high school bands and stuff like that. Yeah. And then when we went on our first tour, it was, I mean, it was bare bones. It wasn't, there was no rock royalty superstar review. Yeah. I mean, it was like, <laughs> we were hurting, you know.
Okay, well then, like, just, let's just go through the progression very quickly right back. I mean, like, for instance, you were in a band, say, like, 11 years ago this summer, mm -hmm. you broke up Mission Impossible, which was mm -hmm. the name of the band, right? But you had bands before that even, right? I mean, you, you, yeah. like, you were playing in bands before that. So what kind of stuff was it? I mean, was it like what you had just heard on the radio? Was it covers of Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and so many bands? Well, the first, the first band I was in was just like Beatles songs and Rolling Stones songs. I was like 12 years old with some people who lived in my neighborhood. And I actually played guitar in that band. And then I joined a punk rock band called Freak Baby. And we split, I played guitar in that, and then started playing drums in Mission Impossible. And that was just like hardcore punk rock. And when, when Mission Impossible broke up then around 85, what's the name of the band? Uh, Bane... Uh, Dane Bramage. Dane Bramage. Ah, yeah. wow. Dane Bramage. That's when I started smoking pot. <laughs> so we were sort of a mix between bands like Television and Mission of Burma. Yeah. And... Um, was there even any Husker Du in there? In any there was a lot of Was then Arcade there. a big album for you? That, that was a, Black that Flag, album was amazing. I mean, Black Flag was early on, and then when I discovered Zen Arcade, I thought, God, these people write songs, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. It's like the birds meets Black Flag, and it was just blew me away. And the songs just stuck in your head forever, and they were just amazing. Yeah. Plus that album, Zen Arcade, was recorded. I think it was recorded just straight. And I think they all took acid and recorded it in 48 hours. They did the whole album. That's what I had heard. And to me, I was just like, oh my God, these people are genius. You know, this is, this is wow. amazing. This is where it's at. Yeah. And what about then, like, I mean, with uh, Dane Bramage, I'm never going to get that bit right. It's okay. Um, Nobody liked us anyway. So. <laughs> but like, is that when you suddenly be like, like, like there's things like songwriting and arranging and dynamics and different tones? That's when I started sort of getting more. That, with that band, we would start every rehearsal with like half an hour of just an improv like noise jam kind of thing and and so many songs stem from that and when i joined nirvana they actually did the same thing and it felt really natural to me and so many nirvana songs just came from these these the you just sit down and you sort of loosen up and you start playing and you know write a song every day and it, it was really cool so that's when dame bramage was when i really started getting more experimental and thinking more about bizarre tunings and different arrangements and dynamics and stuff like that. And then what was Scream? I mean, what, what was so important about the band Scream? Did you... Scream was really established in Washington, D.C. And when I was a kid, I would go see Scream play. Right, so the and idea of playing very well respected in the, in, the, in the D.C. scene, where they, they were one of the, the only bands that, that weren't scared to play like Chantilly Lace, you know, but they were a punk rock band that would that would play Green Eyed Lady or these old rock and roll songs, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was something really cool about them. And um, they grew up in Virginia outside of DC where I grew up. So there was sort of this like redneck bonding kind of thing. And and they were I mean they had toured America, they toured Europe and and I just went to audition just so I could tell my friends that I'd played with them and they asked me to be in the band and I did. So you never thought you were a band member, you just said, like, just to play yeah, with I these guys. Yeah, I just wanted to go and play with them and tell my friends, like, man, I jam and scream. <laughs> so then what happens? I mean, did, like, when you were asked so to join started the band, touring. You, you, you had to say bye-bye to your friends, did you? Yeah. Bad choice, I mean, like, a tough choice, I mean. Well, yeah, it was a tough choice, but it all worked out in the end because for everybody. You, did you go along and see them then, you realize, my God, I now realize what I liked about this crowd, they're so good, I couldn't possibly turn them down. Bye-bye, friends. Well, basically <laughs> what it was is I went and I played with them, and um, and I, I didn't even think that they would want me to play drums for them. I just wanted to, they tried out so many drummers and I came back home and they had called and said, you know, wow, we want to play with you again. And then finally they asked me to join and I, th I was faced with this just terrible decision. And I said, no, no, I'm going to stay with my other band. And, and then I went and saw them at another show and they were unbelievable. They were amazing. And I just thought, you know, this band is so... It would be an honor to play with this band. And the fact that these guys, who were 10 years older than me, thought I was capable yeah. of playing with them. Um. And then what? I mean, if Buzz Osborne from the Melvins rings you up and says, look, there's another band starting here that's called Nirvana, did you not say, look, even though we've lost a bass player in this band, Scream, you know, Scream are a bit bigger than whoever this... Who, who, no, no, I knew who Nirvana was. It, to me, Nirvana was this really weird... I, I'd never... I'd seen them. I, did, I had never seen them play, but I'd seen them backstage at a Melvin show before. And they were the funniest looking people I've ever seen them. Like Chris, the bass player, is six, seven and a half. He's really tall. And, um, and you know, Kurt was, and so there was like these two people that were just totally, incredibly polar. They just looked so weird, you know? But on the cover of their album, Bleach, they looked like these 
big, burly, just scary looking people. And um, and I'd heard their songs before and I liked them. Um, so when he said they were looking for a drummer and Scream had basically broken up, we tried out bass players and we're living off of our friend's welfare money from Canada and not eating and it was, that I said, yeah, sure, I'll try out for another band. That'd be great. And were you happy with the way it all went then? Because the second album just, like, beat, I don't know, sold 26 trillion copies and it went around the world and Kirk Cobain this and Nirvana that. Like, were you happy with the, what had happened and what it was okay? Or was well, it difficult to live with somebody like... in the like... end, I obviously wish that things would have been a little different. Yeah, well, obviously. But at the time, everything just went so fast that nobody really had time to sit down and... I, we still don't understand what happened, you know. It was just too much of it. It was a whirlwind, and I remember things here and there, but my memory is so bad that, that there's a lot of things that I just f forgot, you know. I just forgot. But in the first year of Nevermind, as it was getting bigger and bigger all the time, it became the biggest album of the 90s and all this, was that bit good fun, even? I mean, was it enjoyable? Well, yeah, but I mean... Or was it just too it crazy? Just, well, it was just strange. I mean, it's just something that you never in your wildest dreams had expected to ever, ever. And it was just too, it was weird. It was yeah. just strange. It and were you strange. always writing and recording, or at least writing stuff on the road, yeah. that has now turned up on the first Foo Fighters album, yeah. for instance? You were always. I was. And there was never a question of you wanting to sort of put across your songwriting more than that one song I mentioned earlier on, which was a B-side of a single. Not in, really. In, in there were songs that we, like, um, that we had sort of fooled around with. But we, you know, maybe, Kurt would hear a song and say, wow, that's, pretty, that's really cool, let's try it out. We'd try it out and we'd just forget about it. So. Yeah. Well, in recording the album then, were the lyrics one of the last things you really oh, thought man. about? Oh, man, lyrics are secondary. I am, in, I am not a lyricist. <laughs> I am not a poet. I am, um, I, I'm intimidated by words. To me, melodies and sounds, I'm more focused on having a nice melody or having a good drum sound or having a nice guitar part or something. Um, just for me personally, lyrics are secondary. And you should feel fortunate that my lyrics are secondary. Really? Because they're terrible. <laughs> they're awful. No, but I mean, like, what if, like, I'm not allowed to read anything into then. Like, for instance, the famous refrain from oh, I'll Stick Around is like, I don't owe you anything. There's nothing in I don't owe you anything. I'm thinking, hey, he was in Nirvana. I don't owe you anything. Hmm, that's right. about oh, cool. Oh, well, believe me, a lot of that happened. That was one of the reasons why we started doing interviews, because so many of the lyrics were taken entirely out of context in it. Okay, well then let's go back to the second album then. Just want to know just one or two more things about that. You have a good lot done, but you haven't got a record or anything like that. Right. We have probably about 20 or 24 new songs. We recorded some of them when we went to the studio to record the uh, X-Files soundtrack, Gary Newman cover. But we'll probably re-record them. When, and we've recorded at the BBC, um, and we recorded a few new songs there. But whenever we get in the studio, we manage to do like five songs in the course of three hours yeah so the next album will take about a day to record okay well explain to me then about the video the, the video which is a rip-off of the three ads on american television for some so i don't know what it is exactly Men it's mentos mentos is that what they are yeah mm -hmm. so like i mean you did that in australia in some hotel that's right and, and you got this idea beforehand because it doesn't really seem to like necessarily fit the song as oh such. i think it fits the song perfectly well it does yeah but sorry it does in one way i was just gonna say like it does well in... see here we okay we you have this song it's two minutes and ten seconds long it's ridiculously poppy it's a it's it's taking the piss out of your pop love song you know it's just it's silly it's nothing but a really stupid love song that's two minutes and ten seconds long because if it was any longer whatever so here we had these video directors giving us these treatments for videos that were these and like we're gonna have a silver dog and a silver house <laughs> and like all these like am radio players on a beach and it was kind of silly and they were all ex just very one portrait videos, very pretentious, you know, and it just didn't fit the song. And then someone says, like, well, wow, why don't you uh, do a parody of this? Right. And um, and it's, I mean, if you listen to the, the song, is almost like a stupid candy jingle, you know. I think it fits it perfectly, just because the cheese factor is ten right. on that yeah. song, it's and so with is, the video, yeah. the cheese factor the is bit. fifteen, you know, right? Yeah, so. Right, yeah. But, and then we go on tour and people 
the road. We get pelted with mentors. Not as bad oh, lately, though. Okay. Yeah, they stopped, actually. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, congratulations, both of you, on uh, the album, first of all. I don't know about the second album yet, Thank but you. what we've seen so far. And uh, congratulations also on being the first person to come from behind a drum kit and be massively successful, besides Phil Collins. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, boys. <Yeah. laughs> See you. Thanks a million. <laughs> thanks. All right, thanks, Dave. See you, Will.